All right. So let's go ahead and start the webinar and get things started and let people know we're here. So you ready? Ready. Well, hello. I am very excited today. Beth Edwards is with us and she is going to be talking about something that I had never heard of. I'm, I've been kind of around this business for a little while around the whole senior world. And this is a very exciting new thing for Central Indiana. Uh, something that uh, access to care uh, for helping people age at home that I've never heard of before. So I'm very excited to get Beth to explain it all. Beth, tell us tell us who you are and let's start with, it, with who you are and who you're with. Thanks, Jim. I am Beth Edwards, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications with Ascension Living St. Vincent Pace. We are um, a newer organization in central Indiana. Um, Pace has been around, the concept has been around since the 70s. It started out in California around that time. And Indiana finally introduced Pace about eight years ago through different organizations across the state. So Ascension Living was able to get approval for a service area in central Indiana. So I'm happy to share what that program looks like and how we work with other programs across the state. That's exciting. Well, I mean, you said that it's been in the, in the southern part of the city, what, Johnson County and that kind of area for a while. Um, I hadn't heard about it, but it's been, you know, but I'm down there, but I didn't, you know, know that was there. And you said, where else is it in Indiana? So Indiana, we are the eighth location, believe it or not. Um, Franciscan Health and Wellness Pace was the first one in the state about eight years ago. They started with Southern Marion County and all of Johnson County. And then they also have opened up three additional locations in the state. Their newest is in Lafayette that um, got approval in December of this past year. And then they also have Michigan City and Dyer, Indiana. Um, Trinity Health has a PACE in Mishawaka, and then there's also a PACE of Northeast Indiana operated in the Allen County, Fort Wayne area, and then um, Reed Health out in Richmond also has a PACE program that's been open for the last couple of years. So we are the newest one in the state, and we have about four programs coming behind us over the next couple of years that FSSA has already approved to develop. So we should be hearing news about PACE programs in Kokomo, Terre Haute, Evansville, and Jeffersonville, Indiana. That's outstanding. Well, it's, you know, like I said, it's been in pockets here, but, you know, but really it's still, it's still pretty much brand new to this area. Okay. So I would imagine a lot of the senior professionals don't even know about it or how it works or what have you. So um, well, I bumped into you at, a, at an event the other day, and that's the first time I'd heard about it and moved my schedule around so you could be here right away to speak on this. So so I'm very excited. I want to turn this over to you and let you, I know you have a presentation about PACE. I, you might even tell us what PACE means. Okay. <laughs> and, then, and then let's, we'll, Anybody has questions, we'll deal with that and I'll see what we can do. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm happy to share my screen here with everyone and let you know what in the world PACE is. So Ascension Living St. Vincent PACE, we are one of the entities that operate the PACE model in the state of Indiana. PACE stands for Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. And I'm going to run some technical difficulties here to go to the next slide because it's not letting me. There we go. So this is what PACE stands for. We are Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. And what that means is that PACE, no matter whether you're PACE with Ascension Living or PACE with a different program, uh, the model remains the same. We're wrap around all-inclusive care and services for individuals who are 55 or older that live in a PACE-approved service area meet the Indiana level of care, uh, which means three activities of daily living someone needs assistance with. For those that are familiar with nursing home level of care or the home and community-based waiver level of care, it is the exact same level of care for PACE. And the fourth item is that an individual who enrolls in PACE uh, at their day of enrollment 
has to be living in the community. And PACE, with our wraparound services, needs to be able to show that we can put them and keep them safe in their home. So those are the four criteria across all of PACE. Um, Indiana has the Indiana level of care. And as I mentioned, PACE is a nationally recognized program. It's actually in 32 states across the country right now, serving around 60,000 individuals um, with lives under care in all of those programs. So we just got our approval on June the 7th of this year. So we are up and running for the last two months. Um, that was the first time two months ago we were allowed to share our service area and actually market that we are here and up and running. So that's a big piece of why you haven't heard about PACE um, because Medicare and Medicaid don't allow us to do any marketing or share um, where our location is until we actually have that full approval and we're ready for operations. We're a fully capitated model, which means Medicare and Medicaid give PACE a monthly capitated rate per individual that's enrolled in the program. And then it's up to the PACE program to manage that individual however they see fit. The exciting thing is it gives PACE a lot of creativity and flexibility to care for the person lifetime where they are in their own space. So all of our care delivered in PACE is delivered through different settings in the person's home, at the PACE Center, or wherever that person's healthcare journey happens to take them. And, and what I mean by that is when someone enrolls in PACE, the PACE program itself becomes both the primary care provider, the care network of providers, and um, also the insurance company. So we replace Medicare A, B, and D and Medicaid benefits for someone. It doesn't necessarily matter all of the eligibility prior to PACE. Once they enroll in PACE, they have those benefits at minimum. And then with PACE, there are no benefit caps or restrictions on how PACE can utilize or service the benefits within, um, within what someone needs. So on the screen now, you should see um, a list of traditional benefits that someone in the PACE model receives. That includes all of their primary care, hospital care, specialty care, which is pretty typical. But PACE also provides all of the adult day care, in-home care, transportation, medications, all those ancillary services that people tend to um, lack access to, like dental, vision, podiatry, and audiology. All services, including the durable medical equipment, like hearing aids, dentures, walkers, um, incontinence supplies, oxygen, any of those additional services and um, pieces of equipment are also covered under the PACE benefit. So everything I'm describing here, when I say the PACE benefit, it means anything that's approved by the interdisciplinary team working with that individual, um, all of that is covered at no copay and no deductible, so no cost to the participant as long as it's approved by the interdisciplinary team. PACE is able to pivot and stay with people through all of their healthcare journey. So if someone does need assisted living or they do need rehab care, long-term care or hospital care, or even end of life care and hospice services, all of that is packaged into the PACE benefit. So no one has to leave PACE just because they cannot remain in the community. However, it is PACE's goal to take individuals and work with individuals to live in the community for as long as they wish to and as long as it's safely um, possible. So even through all of end of life care. What makes PACE unique when I talk about that interdisciplinary team and that insurance side of PACE, the unique thing about PACE is that unlike a managed care plan, um, the PACE team treating the individual is an 11-member interdisciplinary team. 
That's not exclusive to Ascension Living PACE. That is across the country PACE. Anyone who enrolls in PACE automatically gets access to an 11 member interdisciplinary team. It doesn't mean the person will and has to interact with all of those people on a regular basis. However, that is the team they have access to, and that is the team helping making insurance decisions for them. So that team is the primary care provider, the nurse, the adult day team, the transportation driver, the therapist, anyone you see on that wheel there is working with our participant on a regular basis. We're a high touch model, which means if we're providing your in-home care, that in-home team is part of your insurance decision-making team. So unlike a traditional insurance company where you are a, may a plan member holder and you don't necessarily have anyone from the insurance company working with you and knowing who you are and your situation and your needs, the PACE team is actually knowing who you are, what your needs are, what your unique situation is. And insurance decisions are based on that from that team delivering that care. The um, PACE model does have care um, or access to your care providers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, it's not necessarily part of the model on a regular basis to have a sitter sitting with you overnight. Um, so it's it really depends on what someone's care plan is. And what that 24 seven means is our team is available for those triage needs, on-call needs, um, unlike some doctor's offices even. So if one of our participants happens to have a fall in the middle of the night, and it's not um, a, an automatic immediate, I have to go to the hospital because I see this big problem, um, they can call PACE and notify PACE even in the middle of the night, this is what's happened, what do we do? So um, there are obviously emergency situations in which you don't call PACE first, you go straight to the emergency room. But in most cases, that individual has the ability to call PACE. And if it's necessary, a PACE nurse or provider can come to the home and help that person with whatever they may need. Um, so that's part of that 24 hour um, care response. Um, so I talked a little bit about um, PACE in Indiana. This is a map of the Indiana sites that are active and in development. So all of the red stars are active programs in the state and all of the blue stars are programs in development. Ascension Living St. Vincent PACE is one of four PACE programs owned by Ascension Living across the country. So we are the newest. Um, our partners have actually been in practice. Um, I've got on my slide 23 plus years. And actually our Chattanooga, Tennessee site will hit their 25 year anniversary this fall, which is extremely exciting. So even though we are new to Indiana, um, Ascension Living and our partners across the country are not new to provide pay services. Um, I talked about a PACE designated service area. So anyone that enrolls with a PACE program, um, we are required by FSSA or the state of Indiana to only enroll individuals within our approved zip codes. So what you see on the screen here is the um, service area that Ascension Living St. Vincent PACE is approved for. We have 47 zip codes across um, the service area. So that does leak into 11 different central Indiana counties. So we cover everything in pink, that's Northern Marion County, and then um, all of the surrounding. And then I talked about our partners to the south of us, the white part of Marion County is Franciscan Health and Wellness Pace, and then all of Johnson County is them as well. And all of this information is also on our website, which I can share um, Jim, with you to post at any point as well. Okay, perfect. And so a few things about what um, a PACE participant typically looks like. So 
We are here to be a wonderful safety net and wraparound care for those individuals that typically fall through the cracks of traditional healthcare models. So PACE isn't necessarily going to be the healthcare answer for everyone. However, those who are struggling to get all of their needs met in their current situation, or they're doing okay, but there is an opportunity for them to be doing better with services, PACE is there for that individual. So typically we're helping support someone who's falling through the cracks um, and maybe they lack social support. They are at risk of going to a nursing home because maybe their family is trying to work and they have someone that they need care for and they're trying to do their best, but there's still that extra risk of they're uncomfortable going to work because maybe that family member does need a little more supervision than what they did before. So PACE is there for those individuals to help decrease the burden of family and living caregivers. We're also there to help individuals who lack the social support of caregivers at all to be able to safely remain in their home or have an advocate throughout their healthcare journey. So we have social workers, and nurse navigators as part of our interdisciplinary and care teams that really help coordinate all services of care throughout the PACE model. So anything the interdisciplinary team approves, that care is actually those appointments are coordinated by our PACE team. Transportation is coordinated for those appointments by our PACE team. And then if the individual needs a care advocate with them at that appointment, and they don't have a, a family or a caregiver that can go with them at the appointment, PACE can actually send an advocate to that appointment, or we do um, very close follow-up with those care providers that we're contracted with to make sure we have the most update information on that person when that appointment is over. And then we can also communicate that information back to any caregiver that's approved to receive information on our participants. So um, when someone is thinking like, okay, is PACE right for me? Or if a professional is saying, ooh, when would I refer someone to PACE? We are here to reduce the healthcare um, costs across the board. Someone that's maybe, they don't have the best access to healthcare because maybe they're missing appointments because they don't have transportation consistently. Maybe they are, picking and choosing which appointments they go to because of the cost of that care and the cost of those appointments. Um, they're trying to choose between purchasing their groceries and purchasing their medications or paying their rent or getting transportation to a doctor visit. Or even they're trying to choose between paying a doctor visit copay and getting their own day-to-day -day needs met. So when PACE comes in and that person is enrolled, they don't have the costs of those extra pieces. They're not paying for medications. They're not paying for transportation. And all of the burden of coordination actually is relieved from that individual so that PACE can help them be educated about their health and be compliant in their services because we're reducing the, the gaps in which they would typically fall through. So someone that's utilizing the healthcare system, maybe they're going to the emergency room instead of going to primary care. Um, maybe they're missing dialysis and then seeking their dialysis at an emergency room because they've uh, struggled with compliance and um, with um, transportation. So those are areas that PACE tends to be that safety net and you see a lot of um, good progress in individuals. Um, this Can is I a, stop and just ask a question real quick? Yeah. On the um, the non-compliant with recommendations or follow-up is a typical, is does that mean the people who are compliant wouldn't qualify or is it just? Great question. They absolutely qualify. Um, and we've seen a lot of success. We see great success for those who are compliant um, as well. It's Typically, when healthcare providers are seeing those that aren't getting the social support they need, they tend to, as a whole, be non-compliant. But um, 
PACE is very successful with those who are in charge of their own healthcare journey. They are financially struggling or they just see a future in, at some point I'm at risk to have to move out of my home, maybe because of a chronic condition. Maybe they want that insurance plan if it's a husband and wife combo and one spouse is the caregiver and completely healthy and maybe doesn't qualify for PACE because they don't meet level of care, but they need an insurance plan for the person they're providing care for. Because if that healthy spouse goes to the hospital and the spouse in need of care is left without that support, who's there to help that other spouse if they don't have a built-in backup plan? Um, so that's a great situation, and I'm, I'm glad that you brought the, up the compliance to clarify. Well, I was looking at your little chart over here as well. You know, it's got the top five chronic conditions. Those are the top five. That doesn't exclude, I mean, you could have Parkinson's, you could have all kinds of other things that could fall into those categories, right? Absolutely, yes. Um, you do not have to have any specific health conditions in order to enroll in PACE. It is open to all. Um, it when we talk about eligibility and qualifying for PACE, it is just those four pieces that I mentioned in the beginning, and we'll touch on another time here in the slides, of 55 and older, living in the service area, and then the biggest component is meeting the nursing home or the home and community-based waiver level of care. Those are the three big ones. And then the fourth is being in the community on day one of enrollment. So. What that means is we cannot enroll someone who is right now living in a nursing home and on day one of enrollment in a nursing home in order to stay there. If someone is in a nursing home and they want to move back into the community with supports, that is where they could enroll in PACE and they just have to be in the community on day one of enrollment. But you would be able to do like an analysis of them while they're still there? Absolutely. Yes, okay. we can do all of our assessments while they're there and we coordinate with the facility on all of that care to make sure that there's not a gap in leaving the facility and enrollment in PACE whenever possible. Now, I may be getting ahead of the game here. You may have all this covered in future slides, but is the is the uh, qualifications pretty much the same to qualify for Medicaid or Medicaid waiver? It is, yes. Okay. So when, when someone wants to qualify for Medicaid or Medicaid waiver, they also need to show that they have level of care. And that, again, is just three activities of daily living. So in PACE in Indiana, you may see some individuals who are currently driving to their PACE center, but they do still have that need for level of care because maybe their mobility is limited their ability to manage their medications is limited and their ability to get themselves showered and or dressed is limited and they can meet level of care. But once they're in a car, they can take off. Um, so it is pretty broad in Indiana um, and it really looks at what are those activities of daily living needs. One, uh, one, uh, I assume, and I don't want to get into the weeds here too much because most people don't understand how much you, how much you can do these things. I know there's still people who think they have to get divorced to be able to qual for one spouse to qualify. It's absolutely not true. In right. fact, it's the worst thing you can do. Um, but if you you made a comment about having one spouse that was in the community that's perfectly capable of living on their own, no problem, and then another spouse that has these issues, so often now that person, one of them ends up in the nursing home and the other one has to go visit. What you're saying is you could possibly do the same things where you make, um, you know, where the what they would have done before, maybe th their elder law attorney would have helped them get the money transferred into the spouse. You know, is that still something that could be done where all of a sudden the person could age at home with that spouse without having to be separated? They can work with an elder law attorney to still, once they qualify for that Medicaid, so how someone would pay for PACE is um, through, and let me get this slide back up. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I just I just was thinking of some things as you're going through here, so. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. So yes, it would work very similar. So if they can get on the um, home and community-based waiver or they qualify for long-term care through Medicaid, that actually funds PACE in full. 
So up on the screen, I actually have a breakdown. In Indiana, for to qualify for PACE Medicaid or Medicaid that would cover PACE, the special income limit is the same as the home and community-based waiver. It's $2,742 a month. And again, what I'm talking about here is only for that individual that wants to qualify for Medicaid. Um, you do not have to qualify for Medicaid in order to receive PACE. Um, okay. Does your PACE cost to enroll does depend on if you do have Medicare or Medicaid. So if you are using Medicaid to pay for PACE in Indiana, you are held to that special income limit. Um, and that gives them access to Medicaid. So the if they make more than that um, special income limit and they can um, still qualify for Medicaid, if they were to enroll in PACE, that amount they make over the special income limit becomes their obligation to PACE per month. So in the example I have up on the screen, if an individual has an income of $2,800 a month and is on Medicaid, they have a monthly obligation of $58 a month. And then after that monthly obligation, there is no copay or no deductible for any service that PACE authorizes. For an individual that does not have Medicaid at all and they uh, maybe need to private pay or they want to private pay, um, they have an option to private pay. And those rates are set by the state of Indiana and the individual pays that directly to PACE. It's called a cost share. And that cost share is basically that person is purchasing their Medicaid benefit if you need something to compare it to. And that's not necessarily for the average person, but it is for those individuals that are um, going to be private paying for all of those other type of services in order to stay in the home. So if they're private paying for private duty care and they have to private pay for transportation and they're still doing copays and deductibles for equipment and doctor visits and things like that, that's where it can be more affordable. Um, but the, the private pay cost is runs typically anywhere from about $4,000 to $6,000 a month, um, depending on someone's age and their previous um, eligibility. Well, this is not in not for you know not necessarily for you to answer, but I just want to make sure that people if it's the same rules that that guide Medicaid, I would recommend someone call their elder law attorney and get information on it will a will a uh, irrevocable trust like Miller's trust. There's ways that that this could be very very easily accomplished, you know. So, but I know enough to be dangerous call someone that actually deals with it. So, yeah. Agree. We make a lot of recommendations to call elder law attorneys as well, because when someone needs care, we want to make sure they get to the experts that can actually help them access the care. Um, we never want anyone to call us and then feel as if our care is out of reach to them. So we do refer out to other entities and agencies that if, if they maybe might qualify for Medicaid, if they have an automatic, we look at them and they have, um, you know, all their finances line up and they said they haven't applied for Medicaid before, we can help them apply and we'll help them through that application here at PACE. But if someone needs the extra steps in order to become Medicaid eligible, we always recommend an elder law attorney um, because they are willing to guide people through. And many of them have free consultations that you can get a consultation without that immediate financial commitment to the attorney. So I always want to make sure people understand that too, that just because we say the word attorney, it doesn't always come with an immediate cost when you make the phone call. Um, From personal so. experience, I will tell you they're worth their weight in gold. So, you know, Absolutely. Yes, it is more than affordable, especially if you're not receiving the care that you really need. Once you start receiving that care, you kind of wonder why you didn't take advantage of it more earlier, right? Absolutely. Um, so back on the screen, I do have those qualifications up again. 
um, there is no wait list for PACE. So in Indiana, there's no cap on how many individuals can enroll in the PACE program in any given month. Now, one of the um, parts of the actual process of PACE, um, PACE programs are not allowed to direct solicit to individuals. We are allowed to take inquiries and if someone reaches out to us or have, we have permission by someone to reach out to them, then we're able to reach out and talk about our program. So um, things like this, Jim, are absolutely invaluable for us to get the word out and having others share that PACE is now an option in all of central Indiana. When we do get that inquiry, a member of our intake team will reach out to that individual. All PACE programs have to do at least one visit to the home of that individual to do what's called an intake. And we're asking that individual all sorts of questions, not to be invasive, but to really get a good picture for our team of how do we best wrap around and get creative to serve this individual. The PACE um, admission and enrollment process is very much meant to be inclusive. It's all about how do we wrap around and help and how do we get creative? It is not about how do we say no? It is all about how do we say yes? So we ask a lot of questions so that our team has the ability to step in and help. Um, after the team does an intake in the house, we have our clinical teams um, review everything that we've gathered. Sometimes a nurse will also come to the house or a therapist may come to the house. Um, we invite potential participants or people interested to come and tour the PACE Center to get an idea of what happens at the center. And I think it's important to clarify here as well that even though PACE has a center, we're very much a community and home-based program that happens to have a location where we also serve people. So um, even though a lot does happen at our center and we encourage people to be at our center quite a bit, PACE is really meant to be flexible to service people where they're at. So the clinical team does that assessment to help us determine that level of care through the state of Indiana. All of that is submitted through the current Maximus or Assessment Pro system. And once we get that level of care back, then that tells us that that person is eligible to enroll. And that person gets to sign their enrollment agreement. After that enrollment agreement is signed, then care with PACE starts the first of the following month. So for anyone that actually signs their enrollment agreement now, their benefits will, with PACE will start September the 1st. Um, so everything does flip on the first of the month. And then we submit everything over to the state to say we have someone enrolled now. And um, that's how they get enrolled. And it's important to note for PACE programs that you do not have to wait for any of the Medicare open enrollment or a special period to open up in order for you to enroll in PACE. You have the option to enroll in PACE at any time throughout the year as well as you can choose to disenroll in PACE anytime throughout the year. So if someone is, maybe their situation changes and they need to move to a different part that's outside of the PACE service area or they're moving out of state, we can help them disenroll in PACE and enroll in traditional insurance products again. So, and then that flip happens at the first of that next month. Well, one of the things that I find just, you know, there's a lot of things about this that I find intriguing. It's a it's a new concept, or at least to me, you know, from what I'm seeing. But what I love about the idea is your 11-member team that, that basically, if this works as you say it does, where they actually talk to each other, which would be a whole new concept in medical, you know, care. Um, I know trying to coordinate trying to coordinate my my mom's and my uncle's care we've hired a you know a nurse advocate who basically oversees that and makes sure all the players are are on the same page because that is a nightmare to try to keep you know 
everybody going in the same direction. And so it sounds like to me that this has a built in the base of the, the of the concept is it's everybody has to talk to each other. It is the interdisciplinary team meets on a daily basis and anytime there is a need that needs to be authorized or if there is a special request by a participant, the interdisciplinary team actually has to meet within a certain time frame um, within a 24 hour period to address that need and actually um, address that authorization. So um, it is it's it's very timely. Everything is very strongly coordinated. You do have very few silos in care when it comes to PACE because the members of the interdisciplinary team are one integrated network. And so they do have to communicate, um, not just for the day-to-day -day care needs, but also the insurance authorization needs. No one member on the interdisciplinary team can make that insur insurance authorization decision without the others involved. And so that's kind of the magic is when an x-ray is getting approved, it's the whole interdisciplinary team is aware of that x-ray and the issues surrounding that x-ray. And then they're all in cadence on what are the next steps to make sure all of our care delivered is in sync with this person's needs. So it's quite magical. Um, to me, it's what accountable care was meant to be when it first rolled out over 20 years ago. And what we as a, um, a healthcare system and society have really tried to work and piece together, um, PACE is able to do that for the individuals that meet that eligibility. Well, I mean, that's that will be remarkable. It's what should always happen, but I've never seen it happen. Let's put it that way. So, you know, that's why I'm very excited about that concept, you know, what can happen there. Um, I saw also that you had a... a graphic that said the average was 16 trips a day. Uh, what does that mean? 16 trips. I mean, you're, you're taking that client somewhere 16 times or you're coming out to see them 16 times. So that infographic actually is from the National Pace Association. They did some um, information gathering for Pace Association or Pace programs across the country. And the average participant enrolled in a Pace program received 16 trips from the PACE program per month. So yes, each PACE participant on average is getting transported by the PACE program 16 times per month because PACE takes on all transportation for to and from the day center, to and from all medical appointments and including dialysis. So. Um, yes, an individual is being transported on average by a PACE program in their vehicle about 16 times per month, um, which is a lot. And, yeah. and you think about every other day, 16 trips per month, the burden it takes for them to coordinate all of that transportation on their own and hope that the ride shows up. And is it going to be an accessible vehicle for me? All of that is taken on by the PACE program. So Ascension Living, St. Vincent PACE, we have our own fleet of vehicles that are all wheelchair accessible. We also have our own team of drivers. And then we have a scheduler and a dispatcher who are coordinating all of those medical appointments in conjunction with their transportation trips. So the way our transportation works is once we've scheduled that trip, we notify the participant, you have an appointment this day and time, your transportation is scheduled to go along with it. We'll call you 24 hours ahead of time to give you a reminder. So we call ahead 24 hours to make sure they're still planning on that appointment and that vehicle to pick them up. And then when our driver is within about um, typically an hour or 30 minutes or 10 minutes, whatever that participant tends to prefer for communication, we work out communicating again with that participant that their driver is on their way. And so if for some reason transportation incidences happen, which we all know they do with traffic and you know equipment breakdown, it's up to the PACE program to actually pivot and figure out how to replace that transportation for the participant and then communicate to the participant and their family on what we're doing about this this issue of transportation that we're aware of. 
And you just don't get that with traditional models and companies. Um, many try and some are doing a great job, but to have it all coordinated, um, because then if it is for a doctor's appointment that we've scheduled, we're also communicating with that doctor's office to say, our transportation is delayed. This is what's going on. You know, Mr. Smith may be late for his appointment. Are you okay with that? Do we need to reschedule? And we're doing all of that coordination for the person so they can focus on their day-to-day -day care needs within their home and not have that be a stressor or um, a distraction for their own day-to-day -day care. That's, that's, that's really good. What, what is, you made a comment that if somebody has to go off pace for whatever reason and that you guys get them rescheduled into the Medicare, Medicaid, whatever needs to be done. Yep. What if, you know, there's 30 states now to have pace. If they're moving mom or dad closer to the kids in a different state that has pace, is that a handoff from pace to pace or how does that work? Um, a little bit, yes. And we've actually experienced that already with our program. Um, okay. When we first opened, one of our first participants was a transfer from California. She was in Pace in California. Her family member lives in our service area and they planned ahead and said, we want to also keep Pace. So it is still a disenrollment and an enrollment into the, each program. Um, the, the process kind of remains the same. Um, the difficult part is with Medicaid. Um, if they are depending on Medicaid to pay for their PACE enrollment, they do have to be, at least in Indiana, you have to be in the state on the day that you apply for Medicaid. So that we've worked with those PACE programs to really tailor that transfer um, and have that gap in care met with other resources before that person can actually get their benefits flipped over. So in thankfully, in the first case that we had, it was just a 15-day flip, and the person was able to be approved, which was amazing. Um, and then we were able to get her enrolled in PACE. So, and, you know, we are getting actually calls. We've had three calls already from other states just since we've been open for two months about individuals that live outside of Indiana looking to move into Indiana and remain with PACE. Excellent. Well, so, but you guys run run the, all the paperwork and figure out how to juggle that, jump through those hoops. It's not the family they're trying to figure out all this stuff, right? Correct. The only part the family is responsible for is um, when we're helping them apply for Medicaid. It's making sure they have the documents gathered. Um, no, you're get, you're basically giving them here's the bullet points of things you need to do. And correct. Yep. And it's very it's not very labor intensive. It's yeah. Because they would have had to have those documents to get, you know, Medicaid the first time. So it's kind of sub resubmitting those documents for them. The reason I'm asking is because, you know, trying to navigate all that stuff is a nightmare. If you don't have like an elder law training, but they don't need one at that stage because they've already got qualified. So you can, you know, help them. I guess that's to me, that's a huge benefit. So. Yeah, the only caveat is that in some states, their level of care um, qualifications are different than ours. So in Tennessee, for example, the level of care, someone does have to meet um, more of a, um, a heavier level of care, I guess. So someone that meets level of care in Indiana may not necessarily automatically qualify for Tennessee level of care. So I do recommend someone switching states to talk to that PACE program ahead of time, or at least talk to that area agency on aging on what does the state level of care look like and is that going to be a barrier to an easy conversion? Yeah, that makes sense. So someone hears about this, they see the video and they're going, man, this could really help out. What do they do? The quickest and easiest thing is to give our team a call. That phone number is 463-271-3700. And that rings right to our receptionist for our intake team. They can also, to learn more about Ascension Living St. Vincent Pace, they can go to our website. And that is Ascension Living backslash St. Vincent Pace. 
um, or if they just Google um, Indiana PACE, it can direct them to one of the Indiana PACE programs. And on our website specifically, they can click on a contact me link and they can just put in their basic information of what they're looking for. And we reach back out to them within 24 to 48 business hours. So we wanna connect with people right away to get them those answers on their care. Um, because we, you know, if they qualify for PACE and they want to enroll, it, it's not an emergency. Hey, we can get you signed up in an hour. We, we can do our assessments and say, hey, yes, you're eligible in a very short amount of time but we do have to wait for the first of that following month to actually get their benefit to flip. So I would say if you're interested in PACE, call the minute you're interested and get engaged with us now because we can talk you through the process, we can get the assessments done and get enrollment agreements signed so that there's not an extra month delay in you getting the care that you need. Excellent. Well, let's just take a little bit of a turn on this. Someone in the senior uh, services profession, okay, that they may be hearing about this for the first time or or what have you. So what message do you have for them? What do they need to know? Are you the contact they need to contact? You know, tell me what what someone sitting out there, they, they work in assisted living and maybe they work as an elder care attorney. Maybe they are, uh, you know, in whatever they are, they may need to be able to direct traffic to your, your way. Absolutely. Um, I am the best contact for that, for that first um, kind of line, if you will. And if you're looking at individuals who are coming to you for care and you're looking for an alternate resource to fit them into because your care just isn't what they need. And, and I see this a lot, um, especially in like the home health realm or the case management realm that Friday at 4.30, um, you know, someone has a care need of someone that's on a managed insurance plan and the care that they really need is you can't find a care provider because of that insurance um, being a barrier, that, that carrier. Um, and so those individuals that you're consistently finding the insurance isn't approving what they need and you're seeing as a professional that's what they need. Um, those are individuals to consider are they better off being serviced by PACE? Um, we also contract with care providers that are not part of our core interdisciplinary team. So for example, we're not a hospital at our center. We have to contract with hospitals. We have to contract with specialty care providers like cardiology and gastroenterology and et cetera, et cetera. And we're contracting with vision, dental, podiatry. So those care providers that have some of those specialties to provide, we're always looking at who are the best partners in different parts of our service area. We do have contracted partners already in place, but it's, it's the basics to get us started to make sure that our participants have access to all types of care and do they have choice within that care network. And that's what we want to build up more of that we can offer choice within our network of providers. So if, if you feel like you have a unique product that is outside of our interdisciplinary team or could be an extension of our interdisciplinary team, um, that would be another reach out to me to learn more about us. Um, we may have those potential participants or clients or patients in common that are really struggling in your program and and belong in pace as well. Excellent. Well, that's great because because I think that's something people need to know about. I mean, you know, I know that's what you're out trying to do right now is to say, hey, we're over here. You know, so uh, uh, so that's very exciting. Anything? We're running closer to the end of time here. Is there anything that you want to make sure that people hear that we haven't covered? I think just to highlight the creativity in the pace benefit. So um, unlike traditional insurance models, PACE, I mentioned before, doesn't really have a benefit cap per se. So a lot of times you'll see a person that's receiving a type of therapy, maybe it's in-home therapy, but under traditional insurance models, once they're no longer homebound, 
they lose the qualification for that therapy. The PACE benefit doesn't put lines and walls around the type of um, benefit you're receiving and when. So if our participants need in-home therapy for a week and then they need to have outpatient therapy at our center you know, for a few days and then we're back in the home because that's what's needed, or maybe this week their treatment looks more palliative in nature and next week, wow, they've had a great week, so let's increase the intensity of what's offered. All of those things are meant to ebb and flow with the condition of the patient. And that's the beauty of the interdisciplinary team. They can change those, um, those needs and those treatments and authorizations based on what's best for this person in their care plan and what matters to them the most. And PACE may be authorizing something that's very non-traditional for an insurance company. Um, in the example of the the spouse and caregiver, um, you know, if the spouse is our participant and caregiver goes to the hospital and they have no family around, instead of that typical situation where an emergency service calls and feels very uncomfortable about what to do with the individual that needs care while the caregiver is in the hospital, that creates chaos in, in the system. Um, no one ever really has a good answer of how do we get that care? And everyone's kind of scrambling about, um, do we take him to the hospital? Do we try to get him admitted into a nursing facility? And will his insurance approve that? It's, it's just a lot of um, coordinated chaos in a way. Now, if that were, um, if PACE were involved, PACE would step in and already know that individual and the interdisciplinary team would look at what's best for him and his situation. Um, if it's an emergency situation, does the interdisciplinary team need to make the decision to send a driver out to pick him up and bring him to the center for a while until we know more of what's going on? Do we need to send an aide to the house to be with him until we know more of what's going on? Um, is it sounding like his spouse is going to be in the hospital for several days? And what does that look like for his care needs being met in that time? So maybe PACE will pay for a respite stay in an assisted living as a creative benefit. Um, so there are all sorts of ways the team can really look at and structure the benefit based on where someone is at in their healthcare journey in the moment. Um, and I use the example a lot of someone with fragile COPD and their air conditioner goes out in the middle of the summer. If our driver goes to pick them up and notices that Miss Betty is walking differently today than she normally does, and she's breathing heavier, the driver is part of that interdisciplinary team. They're part of that regular cadence with that individual. And they're recognizing that change and communicating to the center, hey, something's different with Miss Betty today. They're non-clinical, so they may not be able to understand that it's her air conditioner and her COPD, but they can notice she's different and alert the team. And then the team can wrap around and come together and dig into what is going on with Miss Betty. And once Miss Betty gets to the center, her breathing returns to normal. She's her normal self, but the team's still investigating. And if they learn her air conditioner went out, and it's not in something that she can get fixed, the team could, as a creative benefit, say, this is now part of her health because if we send her back home, she's not going to be able to breathe well tonight and she will end up in the emergency room before tomorrow morning. So the team could authorize to pay for a new air conditioner and have it installed all before she ends up in the emergency room and actually prevent that merry-go-round that many healthcare professionals see of someone in that situation where they get bounced back and forth between the environment that was compromised and the healthcare setting. That's amazing. I One thing you were saying that they, they have to be in the community. When I say in the community, meaning not in a, a, a senior facility. Okay, so in a, in a house of some sort, apartment, when they apply or when they start but did i understand that you can if they also need to go to an assisted living that you can follow them into that that environment 
Yes, absolutely. So PACE will follow them and then PACE actually still becomes their payer in that environment. So if you need to compare it to something, if someone in assisted living had a Medicaid waiver, PACE would become sort of that waiver payer. Um, PACE would remain paying for all of their insurance needs and their care, and the individual would only have to pay their rent or their liability, basically, in order to stay in that environment. So if they were in an apartment, instead of paying rent to the apartment, they, they pay the facility. Um, same with a nursing home. It is our goal to try to keep people living in the community, but across the country, on average, about 5% of PACE enrollees are living long-term in a nursing home and they stay with PACE. And so PACE does pay all of the care. We still deliver all of those medications, all supplies, and we pay for that nursing facility care. The individual just pays their liability that's required by the state, um, which is typically their social security income minus $52 a month. And then PACE is still picking up everything else and still coordinating all the care. The person still has access to come to the day center, utilize all of our transportation, see our team and our uh, care providers for everything. Would someone in independent living still qualify? Because Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, very good. Well, that's a lot of information. We've used up our time, but I wanted to thank you so much for coming. This was amazing. Uh, I will get you a copy of this video. Use it as you please. And if you want to send me your link that you're wanting me to put attached to it, when I do it, I'll do that as well. Um, but uh, thank you so much for sharing. I think this is something people need to know about. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate everything you and Life's Copilot are doing to make sure people have knowledge of resources even before they need them, and then getting care professionals to work together to know what the resources are out there. So thank you. We appreciate your support. Well, thank you. Well. We enjoy it. So I will talk to you later. <laughs> Take Bye -bye. care. Bye.